Good afternoon, everyone. Today's special guest is Terry Kattenbach, CCC Hatchet Force. There, I said it correctly. So good afternoon. How are you today? Doing just fine. So I'm going to try and make this interview uh, as interesting as possible because I know that you and Bud have been doing many. Um, I think it's 17 now? 14, and this week I think we'll be doing one or two. Wow. So that's that's great that you're able to uh, share your your history with people. And I think um, it's really good to focus on one guy at a time. And that's what I'm trying to do. So you get your opportunity to tell the full history, not just chunks of it. So today, um, I know what I mean, I've had uh, the ability to be uh, friends with you for a while now and you and I have talked a lot and you've shared all, all of your photographs which we'll get into on a different uh, you know uh, interview but I know what's really important for you is the difference between a recon team and a hatchet force and off air uh, you you did educate me so um, perhaps can we go into that sure the other than numbers, so a recon team, and I know there's teams that went out there with almost nobody, you know, but the average recon team appears to be eight or nine men, three Americans, six mountain yards or nuns or whoever. Um, a hatchet force, there, for instance, at CCC, we had two, co two companies. So a company would be roughly about 105 men. There was three platoons, and then each platoon was broken down into squads. So you had the company commander and the executive officer. Then each of the three platoons had a platoon leader, and then each squad had an American squad leader. So a platoon would have been generally about 32, 33 men. So a full company was 105, 106 men, something like that. The the concept was, and um, I'll use an a, example that I was involved in when I when I got shot the first time. The recon team was in on a mission, and they located what appeared to be a uh, truck stop, or in today's world we call it a truck stop. It was basically a truck refueling station. And it was felt that that was too much for the recon team to get involved in because they didn't know quite the extent of it. So they sent in my company and uh, to deal with it. So we went in. So generally speaking, and, and again, generally, because there's going to be exceptions to everything, the hatchet force's job was to exploit and that's why sometimes you'll hear it referred to as an exploitation force. It was to exploit a target of opportunity that was identified generally by a recon team. Um, maybe a recon team went in and found a uh, large base camp area and they just were not in a position to deal with something that large. They send in a hatchet force and we'd go in. It, it was basically a numbers thing, um, small numbers, large numbers, um, a lot of similarities, a lot of differences in terms of maybe the loadout, uh, which is something that every time I do an interview, that's one of the first questions that gets asked is about the loadout of recon team versus hatchet force. Um, so um again it was basically um um situation of numbers we would go in and exploit a target identified by a recon team that's now, probably the simplest way to explain it now i've also heard the term uh, you know hornet force have you heard that before never i never heard that while i was over there okay i've heard it more recently right um so I'm not even sure what that would be. Okay, that's 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 two of us then. Now, in some of your some of your photographs, um, 
there were i saw some um uh you know recon team men so there were they also based at the same camp um run that by me again uh in some of the photographs uh oh. that, that you sent me um uh, the man in question would be john uh, john holland now was he was he running recon uh or was that uh, you know hatchet force both okay Jay, uh, and we knew him as Jay Holland, J-A-Y, or maybe just the initial J. Uh, nowadays, he goes by John, but he's still J to me. Okay. Um, he was my roommate in Hatchet Force. And then at some point, I don't remember dates, you know. Yeah. Um, at some point, he left Hatchet Force and went to Recon. Because I know towards the end of 1969 into early 70 he was in recon right he was my roommate um after we moved from the yard camp down to uh the fob in may of 69 i know that in one of those photographs uh jay is um has a big smile on his face and he's drinking white rice wine that's why he had the big smile on yeah. his face because he was <laughs> yeah we were all uh, um those pictures those pictures are actually quite interesting because not only what we were doing was having a party to basically say thank you to our yards because we'd had some hairy missions we'd lost a lot of guys and we wanted to let the yards know that we really appreciated um you know what they've done for us some people called it a bracelet party because of course you know the bracelets were many um so this was in early march of 69 while we were still at the yard camp and during the party our camp commander from down at the fob shows up with these two guys one guy's got a camera and one guy's got a like a movie camera. You know, these are like professional stuff, not, you know, a little pin double ES. Right. And so some of my pictures were taken by this camera guy. You know, and we're drunk, so we're not really paying a lot of attention. Um, about a week later, I get this brown paper envelope full of black and white pictures taken of the party okay fine but again i don't even remember the movie camera deal other than seeing the guy because we were busy drinking about oh let's see 15 years ago maybe the history channel was doing a, a series on elite forces of different countries. And so when they did the one on uh, the U.S., they picked SOG and what film they had or pictures. Well, at 20 minutes and again at 40 minutes into the show, clock time, not, you know, not counting commercials and all that, um, here's the here's video of this party and of course holland that big old smile of his through that big mustache um well i was in the same condition he was in we all were um so it, 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 you just never know is i guess my point what's gonna show up years later right and of course it couldn't show up until everything got declassified right but um now is that the um would you be able just to adjust your camera just a little bit a little bit the other the, there you go that's wonderful okay. thank you yeah that's wonderful there we go thank you for doing that um now the footage that they took is that the ones with the indige um uh you know boxing oh no 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 this is footage i don't have right i i it's out there somewhere, right. probably like, you know, Getty Images or these places where TV shows go to get footage. 
Right. It's out there somewhere, but I have no idea where the History Channel got it from. Yeah. The um, the footage of the uh, boxing, the yards boxing. Right. Yeah. I took yeah. that myself. Oh wow! Really? Um, well, I sent you a copy of my videos. Yes. I, you know, so I took all of that. Um, we were having a problem with the yards. You know, they'd get pissed off at each other for one reason or another. And we had a couple of incidents that we are able to prevent, but there was going to be a shootout. Wow. So Frank Bellatier, he's the heavy set bald guy in the pictures with the white short sleeve turtleneck on. He had somebody from back home send him a couple of pairs of boxing gloves. So we got together with the yard company commander and said, look, you know, we can't be having shootouts and all that we're going to do these boxing matches and let these guys beat the hell out of each other legally. And it worked. It worked. We started at our five o'clock formations in the evening. We'd have, if we knew two guys were, uh, uh, and the yards were really good about policing themselves. So we didn't have a need to really get involved for the most part. Um, but we started having these boxing matches and it went over really big and the yards actually got to enjoy it. Um, it's, it's definitely a different thing to watch them fighting. I mean, most of us yeah. here in the Western world know how to throw a punch to summer, but you can just see how um, that they had never seen it on TV and just, it was interesting to watch. You know, I told you once before that, um, Sometimes a discussion or a picture or whatever leads to another story. I've heard it on other podcasts and whatever said um, down behind the yard camp was the range and the guys from the FOB, as well as us at the yard camp, we'd go down there and practice immediate action drills. We'd practice target firing. We'd practice throwing grenades and in my pictures, there's a picture of me on the berm with a yep. couple of the yards. The problem was the yards, just like they didn't know how to box, they didn't know how to throw a baseball overhanded. Right. And it was not uncommon out in the field on a mission that a yard would throw a grenade and it would come out of their hand as they raised their hand back. And other than a few pieces of shrapnel, I, I don't know of anybody ever getting killed, but there was a definite need to work with them on practicing. And in that one picture of me, you'll see I'm standing up straight as tall as I can, and I've got my arm straight yeah. back, and I'm trying to demonstrate to them throwing overhand. It didn't work. So the best we could hope to do was teach them to pitch a grenade underhand like a softball. Wow. At least they could get that out away from us, whereas throwing overhand, it's either going to fall out of their hand backwards or it's going to fall out of their hand right in front of them, wow. you know, and then maybe kill a couple of guys. So th there were things like that that it's just by the nature of their life right. that they just couldn't learn how to do. Now – as far as um, indigenous food, was there anything that you tried that you liked? <laughs> Rice wine. Right. <laughs> um, one time after we moved down to the FOB, um, if we weren't out in the woods on a mission, some of my yards would take me and we'd go up in the hills behind the camp and they'd take their crossbows and shoot monkeys. And then, you know, you cook monkey, you go down in the village and, you know, um, because I had a couple of Montagnard girlfriends, I, I was invited. It was like a standing invitation to go to the village well, one Sunday, I really screwed up. I drank the village chief under the table. And as a result of that, I was required to make an appearance at every opportunity. 
<laughs> oh my God. So you'd have monkey, you'd have dog. And um, when we'd be in camp, not on a mission, on stand down or whatever, you spent a lot of time working on the fortifications around the camp, like the uh, sandbags, for instance. Right. Oh, the yards loved that because they were always finding rats. And they'd take a rat, they'd catch a rat in their hands, they'd take a string and put around its neck, and they'd tie it to the button on their shirt pocket, and they'd put the rat in their pocket until lunchtime. Oh, <laughs> oh it's crazy. And then at the, um, you know, the camp was divided in two by Highway 14 went right through the middle of camp, which to me, that was the stupidest design of ever because you had to, at night, you had to close the highway off completely. You had to have guards on both ends and you had these little guard shacks where you come to about halfway the distance between the two ends of the camp. And that would be the entrance to the two sides of the camp. And there were guard stations where they would check like all the Vietnamese helpers in the morning, they check their IDs and all that kind of stuff. Well, there there were these big fluorescent lights up there, and there was some kind of bug, and I don't know what it was, but they were about the size of your thumb, and they had these big wings on them. Well, the yards would get out there at night, and they'd catch these bugs, and they'd tear the wings off, and then they would take these bugs and mix them with some greens and they'd boil them in a, you know, like a beer can or soda can or whatever. And that was, that was a delicacy for them. So the, the, the learned thing was, I know the first time I went to Saigon on stand down, I had an old timer and I won't name his name, but he taught me, he said, look, you go in Mama Bick's bar, if there's any legs in there, you got to throw their asses out. But if you want to throw them out without having to lay a hand on them, you either buy a, a little bird or a non-poisonous snake from these street vendors. You go in and you bite the head off and spit it out on the bar. The key to it, he said, is... <laughs> The key to it is you got to be so drunk that your taste buds are just completely numb. Otherwise, you're going to get sicker than a dog. So the same held true when you'd go down into the village with the yards, since you never knew what you're going to be eating. It was a pretty good idea to get snockered first and just get those taste buds numbed. And there was some stuff that I, ugh, God. Uh, and they understood that. I mean, they didn't get offended to the point where it pissed them off and they'd never invite you back because they kind of understood that we had different food tastes. But now, the uh, uh, just for the public, um, I know that uh, to, at, um, you know, Quezon, that the rats we're not talking normal size rats. Right. Oh, no. We're talking like, like little dogs. Yeah. Yeah. So, or a cat. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were well fed. <laughs> well, you got to remember now that no matter where you're at, whether you're in the field or in camp or whatever, there's always going to be garbage. Yeah. Well, you know, so the rats and Quezon was one of those examples that just everybody hears about because everybody hears about Quezon. But it wasn't just a case on it's wherever there was a garbage dump, there's going to be giant rats. Ugh. Uh, so going yeah. so, so going back to the uh, to the range and when you're teaching the yards, did you teach them like, uh, you know, instinctive shooting? Oh, yeah, I. Uh, you know, I, I grew up with guns and, you know, you get out there target shooting or whatever. And it was always a challenge to like shoot from the hip or what we call point and shoot. Um, I actually taught that years later when I was a cop. Um, we called it instinctive shooting then. Um, 
don't don't worry about using your sights. You need to be able to, whether it's from the hip or raised up, you need to be able to hit what you're shooting at without wasting time focusing on trying to get a good sight picture. Because unless you're playing Joe Sniper or something like that, <laughs> normally you don't, in a firefight, you don't have time to be yeah. screwing around with trying to get a good sight picture and all that kind of stuff. You've got to shoot instinctively because the difference that split, even a split second or two means the difference between living and dying most of the time. No. So there is a, sorry to cut you off there. There no, is no. one uh, shooting technique and you, I think you touched on that where it's, they say you point, if you, I guess with a pistol, you just don't think about it. You point to where you want to shoot. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and that and that was just one one technique that that uh, that I I was reading about. You know, just don't try and aim just wherever if it's close, just wherever that you're pointing. That's aim aim the pistol there. Right. It was just a, a different way of shooting. Yeah. There's yeah. There's there's just a lot of different ways of doing that. Um, you know, and it's always. Um, <laughs> It's always a challenge to uh, maintain the mystique, I guess you'd say. So about, uh, uh, let's see, my wife and I have been married 28 years. So about 27 years ago, um, we were at my daughter's, which had been my wife's place when we met. And um, um, stupid me left my pistol at home and I was weed eating. And this copperhead comes out of this hole. You know, and copperheads are pretty common around here. So this copperhead comes out of the hole. So I real quick called my wife, which was just like three miles up the road. And I said, bring my 22 pistol down. So she grabs it and brings it down. And I'm standing there with it down, you know, along my leg, waiting on that copperhead to stick its head back out. And as it did, I instinctively without raising the pistol up even waist high, I fired and shot the head off the copperhead. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, but it's, it's an instinct it, and it takes practice. It's not something it, you may have a little bit of the, whatever the right word would be talent or technique or whatever, but it takes practice to do that kind of stuff. Um, so we would practice, um, uh, immediate action drills down there on the range going back to your original quote this is how i get sidetracked sometimes um but in addition when we would call like for instance i i know um i would call ambush on the right or something like that and the guys would practice their movement of how they're going to react when they started shooting, I wanted them to concentrate on instinctive shooting, not Rambo type, just spray a whole round. You got to conserve your ammo. That That's a key thing. But at the same time, you want every shot to count. You want it to go where you're trying to put it. And so we would com combine the two things of, of, uh, an immediate action drill as where as well as instinctive shooting. Um, so when you, I think when it you, worked pretty good. When you watch a movie, um, like a Vietnam War movie or any war movie, what makes you laugh the uh, most? I mean, what do you? I mean, of course, like you just hit on Rambo. So Rambo shooting his M60, and there's like suddenly he's got like 500 rounds. So what are other things that you've seen that have made you laugh? Like, oh my god. Noise discipline, <laughs> you know. Now, again, the difference between recon and hatchet force, recon, if they're lucky, the bad guys don't know they're there because that's the, that's the goal. That's the ultimate goal is they don't know you're there. With hatchet force, it's a guaranteed fact. You can't put 105 guys on the ground with yeah. 20 choppers or whatever and the bad guys not know you're there. Plus they had their spy in Saigon that was telling them the LZs of your, the coordinates of your LZ. So they knew you're there. So noise discipline was not 
as important, but it was still important to a point, um, especially if you're going to take a, four or five guys and go down on an ambush along the trail to try to get a prisoner. Uh, noise discipline was crucial. Um, and when you see these movies and stuff on TV, that's something that always jumps out at me is the lack of noise discipline. Um, and of course the shooting, you know, you know, just take a 30 round clip and empty 50 rounds into the bad guy without reloading. Um, those kind of things, just the ones of us that have been there and done that know it ain't realistic. It may look good on film. It may look good to Hollywood, but it's not real. Is there any movie that you've seen that um, there are aspects of that movie that you felt were on point where they had done their background research? Yeah. Um, um, God, now I'm, I'm, um, I'm having trouble thinking of the name of it. Um, what, what year did it come out? Oh, hell, I don't know. Probably back in the 80s or 90s. Um, Platoon. Platoon, yeah. Platoon, there's two that I can't think of the name of the other one, but yeah. Platoon was the other one that um, it was pretty obvious that they had done a lot of research, you know. And and were you were you able after um, after you watched that movie, did you watch it at home or did you go to the uh, theater? Uh, we watched it on DVD. OK, so after you yeah. had watched that um was that hard for you to watch after you turned no. it off no you no i and and i know i'm not alone in this i feeling but you know if you think about it we volunteered for the army we volunteered for jump school we volunteered for special forces we volunteered for vietnam we volunteered for sag with our wives wide open right so there's there, it's not like you know, we didn't know what we were doing. So I consider myself, I guess, fortunate that I don't think I have PTSD for a number of reasons. Um, um, I think um, you have to keep everything in perspective. And number one, you know, okay, it's a movie. Yeah, there's there's realistic parts of it and there's not so realistic parts of it, but it um, it's telling a story and, you know, the difference between truth and fiction. Um, and it and we're thank God we're finally seeing more and more of the guys who for years have not wanted to talk about their experiences. And now between you and the Budcasts, guys are willing to sit down and talk about their experiences. Um, so I think a lot of us have gotten past that thing where maybe it bothers us, you know, um, that's so, my take on it. Okay. So when was your first, um, and thank you for the, uh, for the, for the, uh, for the compliment, you know, I mean, um, I think it's so important that your histories are kept for people to see now and much later in time. When I was talking to John yesterday, I said, you know, 20, 30 years from now, people will be able to look at this and say, this is Terry or this is John or Lynn or whoever it is, you know, and these are words from them. And that's so important. These are your stories in your words. So thank you for spending the time to uh, come on here today. Um, what I was going to ask you is, do you remember the first time that someone someone shot at you in Vietnam? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah, because well, yeah, because the first person, the first it, person I shot wasn't in Vietnam. Okay, so but, um, let's just. So I I'm got sorry. there. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. Yeah. <laughs> um uh Petersburg, Virginia in 1967. Um when when I got there, and I've heard some guys say they were given a choice of recon or uh hatchet force, 
I hell, I didn't even know what hatchet force was. So when I got to Contum, that's where I got assigned to. They just immediately said, you know, well, you're going to hatchet force up at the yard camp. They had a Jeep come get me and that's where I went. So I, I didn't have a choice. I would not trade the experience for anything. Um, but, um, uh, where were we going with this? It was your anyway. first time with, uh, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Combat. Yeah. So I had only been there maybe two to three weeks training every day. Cause you know, I'm brand new cherry. Right. And, um, um, captain gets us all together and he says, uh, we're going on a slam in hotel nine. Okay. First of all, what's a slam? He says, well, it stands for search, locate, annihilate, and monitor, but we changed the M to mean mutilate. Not for real, but yeah, that was what, you know. Yeah. So I said, okay, so what is Hotel 9? And he's like, well, every area of operations is a six by six kilometer grid on the map. And Hotel 9 is up adjacent to an area of a river called the Bra because of the way it winds. And he said, it's a guaranteed fact if you go into Hotel 9 that you're going to get the hell shot out of you. So just know that. So we do the briefing and all that. And it was decided that this was going to be a two company operation. So both B company that I was in up at the yard camp and A company down at the FOB, we were both going in on this operation because we already knew there was a regimental base camp in that area and all that. So we go in and I think it was, well, I don't know if it was the first day or the second day. I think it was the first day. Anyway, I'm up in the very front in point with Captain Ron Goulet, who was our company commander, who's now KIA. Jim Jerson, who was our XO, who was KIA a month later. And my interpreter and, and three other yards. So we get down to the bottom of this mountain. On the map, it shows this big mountain, but in truth, it was three mountains, straight up, straight down. Well, at the bottom of the second one, we're filling our canteens because there's this nice clear water running. And then we look at the going up the next mountain and there's steps cut into the side of the mountain. So right away, you got to be on the alert because, you know, we're fixing to get shot up. And on the map, it showed that if we got to the top of this hill and went down the other side and crossed the Ho Chi Minh Trail, there was a big open area. And we wanted to get across that open area and up on the high ground before nightfall. And this was late morning. You know, I, I, I'm guessing I think it was around 10 o'clock or something. And um, um, so we start going up and we get to the top and there's the seven of us on the top of the hill. And I tell Captain Goulet, I said, why don't I take my web gear off and I'll climb this tree and see if I can look out over this triple canopy and see if I can see that open area. Just as I unsnap my pistol belt to take my gear off, all hell broke loose. The three yards in the front were killed immediately, I believe by a rifle grenade or some type of grenade. The other four of us were pinned down. My uh, rifle took a bullet to the flash hider, so I couldn't fire. And then my rucksack had bullet holes across, you know. <laughs> now, this was my first time in combat, right? And I'm puckered tighter than a well digger's butt. And it's like, okay, what are we going to do? Because the fire is heavy and we're pinned down. So I crawled over to the edge of the hill that we'd just come up and they had taken a couple of grenades and they had a number of wounded. 
So I got a grenade, uh, an M79 grenade launcher and a bandolier of uh, high explosive rounds from one of the yards, crawled back up, told everybody to get their head down. And I started firing it like a mortar, just barely off of dead center up because I wanted it to be because they were close. They were right on top of us. And I emptied that bandolier and uh, took care of the bad guys. And uh, <laughs> after we got back to camp a couple of days later, um, Goulet says, well, we're writing you up for a silver star. And stupid 19-year-old or 20-year-old me says, you know, I was just doing my job. I'd kind of like to go home at the end of my tour. So I'm not out there trying to collect metal so they didn't write me up looking back on it yeah it would have looked good on a resume i guess but that's not what i was there for um i think the majority of us felt that way you know we were there to do a job we weren't there to collect metals now there were certain people who were there to collect metals you know but that's i don't even talk about that um the interesting thing about this ambush is one of the weapons that we recovered was an M16. So we sent it off to Saigon and they did the research and they came back and told us that this weapon had been captured by the NVA at the Battle of Dokto in 1967 wow. on Hill 875. So that was the 66th NVA regiment where are we? We're in Hotel 9, knowing that there's a regimental base camp. My guess is it was the 66th NVA regiment. You know, it all kind of goes together at some point. Um, so that was my first time in combat. They um, um, all night long, I got introduced to Green Hornets, which was basically um capsules green and white capsules of speed i guess some kind of amphetamine to keep you awake all night because all night long you could hear the trucks pulling up at the bottom of the hill and the tailgates drop and you could hear the voices and so we knew the next morning we're and we're in for really deep doo-doo so you don't sleep and it was common to do that and maybe not sleep for two or three days and you're going on pure speed and adrenaline. And uh, I think that's why after a while, a lot of us, a lot of us became adrenaline junkies. You're always looking for that next fix, which the fix being whether it's a firefight or the adventure or whatever, um, you live for the adrenaline. And that why that's why a lot of us had trouble adjusting when we came back to the states. Right, right. I can imagine taking taking a step back to the to the uh, Green Hornet uh, pills. I mean, I know <laughs> that your the your dad served during World War II, and yep. um, like just for the public, this was not a new thing that uh, you know combat troops would be taking. Uh, you know that kind of thing. You know, World War. Uh, I mean, the Germans that they were doing it. And uh, when they were when uh, the allies were attacking the Germans, they were wondering, how come these guys keep coming forward? Right. So yep. and pilots, I mean, they were, you know, wake up pills or this is not a new thing is what I'm trying to say. Right. So exactly. The only problem being um, and this is uh, not not that I've ever tried them, but with any of those kind no. of things, any of those kind of things, you have this massive adrenaline dump. And after that adrenaline dump is gone, then you just like when you came home after that, I'm sure you were wiped. You might sleep. It was nothing to sleep for 48 hours. Yeah. So your body, you know. it's there's oh. a trade off, right? There's a trade off yeah, between right. that adrenaline drop. After a while, you start shaking. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, it, it's just a, a amphetamine high. Yeah. So when was uh when you actually saw the first enemy soldier um either dead or alive what did you think of them when you're seeing them up close and personal 
are they was the enemy what you expected them to be? Uh, yeah, I mean, we knew they were North Vietnamese regulars. They we weren't dealing with Viet Cong wearing black pajamas. These guys were wearing khakis and pith helmets and most of them had fairly I would say fairly new gear. Um you know, it's what we had been trained to expect to see. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think there were any surprises there. Um, and did you ever see any any uh, Chinese troops? Let's put it like this. I brought home a uh, never-worn Chinese officer's uniform. Okay. And I had that thing until... 15 years ago and my basement flooded at the old house oh. and it got all wet and moldy and I had to throw it away. Um, when I was over there, I was 5'10", 165 pounds and that uniform fit me. Wow. So that kind of tells you, and I've read other accounts from other guys too, that the Chinese were considerably larger than the average NVA soldier. Yeah, I'd say an average NVA soldier was maybe uh, five, seven, five, eight, five, six, some, somewhere in that neighborhood, whereas the Chinese uh, tended to be more maybe five, ten, 160 pounds, something like that. They were bigger. Um, so, yeah. Um, and he didn't need the uniform anymore. So I, I just kind of liberated it. You know, yeah, I've heard that expression. I've got some um, some knives that were uh, taken off of two uh, VC sappers by a Canadian, uh -huh. a Canadian, uh, you know, Marine Corps vet. And he said to me with dark humor, I mean, all you guys have dark humor. He said, yeah, they didn't need it anymore. So I've got exactly. them down, I've got them downstairs. That's kind of. Uh, yeah. But I mean, on the uh, topic of humor, um, I think people who are new to interacting with either policemen, firemen, uh, you know, veterans may consider the humor to be really off color and dark at times, but that's a, a coping mechanism, right? Exactly. Um, I think there was several coping mechanisms because, you know, you're dealing not only with the stress of combat, yeah, um, but you're also dealing with seeing your friends. Yeah either get killed or missing, even missing in action, which I have several. Um, the drinking was another coping mechanism. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to lie and paint a pretty picture and say that there weren't guys doing uh, dope because there was. Um, I only know of one instance of somebody doing something other than marijuana. Um, and that was the guy that recon team leader that was caught by Colonel Apt up at Docto when they were getting ready to go in on a mission. But uh, other than that, it was just marijuana. Um, I never did it because I don't smoke, never have, never will. Um, I had no desire to smoke the shit. So my thing was either rice, wine or beer. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, when I came home for good, the month that I was home on leave, I was drinking two cases of Budweiser a day, a day. And when I reported in down to Fort Bragg, I went cold turkey. And that, ne that nearly killed me. Yeah. But, and, and hearing that, I mean, um, I've had a I've talked to many World War II veterans over the years. So in, in total, in my life, I've talked to many veterans. And up until really probably the early 80s that you guys, if you were combat veterans, drinking was quite common when you came, when to cope with just daily life, right? Um, yeah. You know. And, you know, and um some vets may not like to hear this, but that's why I never joined like the VFW or the American Legion. I don't want to be the first one when the bar opens at eight o'clock sitting there crying in my beer about what a bad rap the army gave me or, you know, and I was a cook and yet 
you know, I've got PTSD and all this other crap. I, I, I don't have any regrets and I, I don't feel that way. So I didn't want to be associated with that kind of mentality, you know. So moving a little bit uh, forward in your in your life, um, after you came back from Vietnam, how long before that you joined the police force? Oh, let's see. I got back. I reported into Fort Bragg in May of 1970. In September of 71, they decided that they needed to rebuild my right ankle because Right. In January of 68, I'd shattered it on a parachute jump. So they rebuilt it, October 16th, 1971. It got infected in the operating room. And um, I spent, they were going to cut my leg off because they couldn't kill the infection. And literally 30 minutes before they were going to take me to surgery, the fever broke. But as a result of it, I spent three and a half months in the hospital and one day they came to me and said you're never going to be fit for duty again so start processing out and two days later as I was signing out the sergeant major first sergeant I guess he was said don't forget to call the VA when you get home so 31 January of 72 was my last day in the army and I got home to St. Louis. Well, what is a special forces weapons guy going to do in civilian life? And I thought, well, you know, I wouldn't mind being a cop and do good deeds and, you know, get rid of bad guys. Kind of the same idea of combat, get rid of the bad guys. So I decided to be a cop. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, part of the hiring process is they send you to a shrink. And this shrink, I'm telling you, he told them, he told the chief that um, I was such a hard ass that I would arrest somebody for spitting on the sidewalk. Which, you know, whatever. Nevertheless, this chief on his small department decided to take a chance on me. And... Um, <laughs> A year later, I had more felony arrests than the other 10 guys on the department combined. <laughs> so then I started working plain clothes. And, uh, you know. So at this at this point, where I'm going with this is you must have had interaction with quite a few men that told you that they had served when they probably didn't or told you that they did things behind enemy lines that they couldn't talk about and you would probably laugh to yourself, right? I'm sure everybody's met those kind of people. I, I, I give you the perfect example. So, you know, I'm, I'm a gun guy, obviously. And I was at a gun show and there was this little guy, as a bunch, this guy's maybe five, seven, five, eight, wiry little sucker. And he's wearing a tan beret with a fifth group flash on it and some other pins and crap. And he's telling this, I'm overhearing this conversation. He's telling this poor guy, yeah, I was in this super secret thing called SOG and there's nothing in my records and we didn't have dog tags. We did this, not all this bullshit. And the guy's like, well, where where were you located? Now you got to remember this was in oh early two thousands, very early two thousands. And the guy's like, "Well, where where was your camp?" And he says, "Oh, we were all over. We didn't have a camp. They just moved us around." Well, so far everything that this guy has said is pure bullshit. Number one, yeah, our records didn't say SOG. They said SOA. CCC, 5th Special Forces Group, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, anybody that knows anything about SOG knows that SOA, CCC means I was in SOG and I was at CCC. So, yeah, it doesn't specifically say SOG, but it is in your records. This this bullshit about, well, there's nothing in my records. And uh, right away, you can, and over the years, I think all of us have learned 
when you hear these stories, everybody wants to be in SOG. So you hear these stories and it's very, very easy to pick them out. Um, back in the uh, late 80s, I was a manager at the telephone company. And this gal that I worked with, her husband claimed to have been special forces, secret, no records, blah, 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 and all this crap. <laughs> I did some research on him and come to find out he's one of the, uh, what do they call him, the stolen valor right. guys. Very well known uh, name. Uh, they've been on to him for years, um, you know. So, yeah, we, we kind of learn just little things that are said um, you pick up on. And um, maybe you don't get every single phony, but you'll get 99% of them. I had um, something happen um, on my private SOC page, which you're on, which you have to be, uh, just for the public, you have to have either a family member that was in SOG or be a veteran. Um, your everyday person is not allowed on there. Um, but I had a woman reach out to me and say, my husband who's passed away, he was in SOG. And I'm going to be very careful. Um, I'm not going to use any names uh, because it doesn't have a good a good outcome. So I said, um, I can help you, you know, find out more about your husband. I said, do you have any photographs? Yes, I do. So she sends me two photographs. I'm looking at the picture and looking at his most recent picture, which was 10 years old. And I thought, hmm, something's off here. Um, so there is a picture of Lee, of Lee uh, Birkins. Um, uh, and he is sitting down in his uh, uh, maybe the changing room or some, and he's holding uh, an AK in his hand and he's looking at the camera. He's got his boonie hat down low. Mm -hmm. And I saw this picture and then I saw the one that the woman has sent to me. And I thought that's the same background. Well, what the heck? So then I followed the, 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 the breadcrumbs. Then I realized um, that long story short the man had said that he was a sog a soldier and the soldier that he was stating that he was had been killed in in, in, in action oh. so i had i had a dilemma and i thought now do i tell the woman that this was all bs about her husband or do i let it go and i thought in the man's memory who died, and you might know this story, so if you do, then you'll know who I'm talking about. Um, the man who was killed, he was in, um, uh, he was in a, a like a, the weapons hut, and he dropped, uh, you know, Willie Pete. And yep, I know exactly who you're talking okay. about. Okay, all right. So this other stolen valor guy was claiming to be him. So I decided that in his memory, it was up to me to tell this woman so i told her and i said i have some unfortunate news and i said the man who your husband was trying to be in the photographs is actually so and so um and i said and here's his i gave her all the facts and i, I didn't say any more to her um but that was uh very uncomfortable to have to do that but yeah i feel it was the right thing to do you did the right thing. I would have done the exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, there's just too much of it going on. Yeah. You know? yeah. I, I just don't understand it, you know, and I don't think it, it's going to go away. And I think the more of these talks that happen, um, the better it is, because then people realize, OK, I heard Terry say this or I heard so and so say this. Hmm. That doesn't sound right. And you know another short story there's a guy of course there were guys from canada who uh went down to the u.s uh, there's a handful who got into sog so i'm at an antique show and i'm always looking for you know military stuff and all the rest of it well i get told there's this guy who was a navy steel he was in sog and he was in special forces and this and that mm. and i'm going okay and he said he carries around with him his photo album 
Now, which combat vet would you know that would ever carry a photo, right? Why oh, would you do that? Please. So anyway, I didn't actively search this guy out. But one day, I did an antique show, and I was selling some of my World War II stuff. And who should come up? And he said, yeah. He goes, uh, I was in saw. Oh, and then it dawned on me. And I played hmm. dumb. I said, really? I said, uh, where where were you based? Yeah, I was here. I was a Navy SEAL and I was based here and here. I said, oh, did you ever go over the fence? And he goes, why are you talk talking to me about fences? I said, did <laughs> you? <laughs> and I, oh, I God. said, okay. I said, okay. So I laughed to myself. And I said, uh, which team were, were you on? So he tells me which team he was on. I said, oh, as it happens, I said, I know two guys who were still alive on that team. I turned my head to talk to somebody else, turned around. He was gone. Gone. Yeah. Gone. You know, yeah. and it's like, come on, man. Like, you know, so I told all my uh, antique uh, friends and, and I said, that guy is full of shit. I can tell you 100 percent. He didn't know the one terminology over the fence. Exactly. You know, and uh, that's very sad that um, that he probably has told hundreds of people. And, um, you know, who's going to question if you're an average person? Who's going to question, you know, a veteran, right? Because they don't know. They don't you know. know. So, you know. These stories remind me, and this has probably been 20, 25 years ago, but the TV show. Um, uh, Tour of Duty? No, uh, the news. It's a news show. Um, the one on ABC that Geraldo used to do. Um Oh, shoot. Not 60 minutes. Okay. Um, anyway. Yeah. They did a they did a, a show on they took three veterans who had been in Vietnam. They took them back to Vietnam and they, sh you know, show where they were at, where their camps were at and all this good stuff. And then as the show goes on, they're talking to each one and each one of them's Oh, I got PTSD so bad, and I've been married three times because I'm a drunk, and this and that and the other. And finally, and they waited to do this till the very end of the show, because if they didn't, they wouldn't have had a show. And they asked all three of these guys, well, what was your job in Vietnam? And this one guy says, well, I was a supply clerk. So how does that give you PTSD and all this, you know, stuff? And he says, well, we got more, our camp got mortared one time. And as I ran out of the building, I tripped over a body. That's it? Yeah. So that's caused you to be married three times and have PTSD and flashbacks and all this other stuff that, no, that's bogus. The bottom line is you're a drunk and just, call it for what it is and the other two guys were similar one was a clerk typist and i think one was a um i don't know something else supply or whatever none of them were combat guys but yet they're so screwed up you know <laughs> so yeah there, there's so much of that that i don't understand and i i get kind of vocal about it because i can yeah Cause I've been there and done that and I know. Yeah. And when I hear crap like that, it just makes my blood boil, you know? So. So on, on a, on a different note, um, are you quite surprised in the last five to 10 years of how interested people are on in SOG? I've said this, on the budcast a number of times and i'll say it on here i am very humbled to see the amount of interest that's out there in hearing all of us tell our stories and there's not enough of us yet that have told our stories but it's very humbling to see the amount of interest in it considering what we went through when we came home you know that's yeah. And, you know, that's kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, 53, so I could very easily be your son or any, you know, I mean, my mom's 78, 
actually my mom right now funny enough is in is in uh vietnam she's yeah i saw that picture today Mar marble mountain she'll probably kill me for posting it but <laughs> i'm so i'm 75 right now so i could be your daddy there you go okay dad yeah. then i'll ask you yeah. this, this question so yeah. um you know what i find surprising is that there's an age group that is like 30 to 25 in there that really i mean of course what they're reading about vietnam um is all through books right and um yeah. and i now this may offend a few people um but this is my viewpoint um i personally this is me I personally have a little bit of a problem with people playing games like uh, video games. Um, you know, it's all good to be entertained, but at the end of the day, you can turn that off and yeah. go and go and have your beer or go and go to the gym. But guys like you, that was no game. And I think that people, if you're going to play those games, then read about the men that got killed and that are still over there and not and exactly. their families. Don't just, just take this one aspect of this high intensity combat and feel that that's anything like the real deal. So that's, and it kind of angers me a bit that people with their headsets on and, you know, oh yeah, I played, you know, Call of Duty and it's not, I'm not picking on just that one game, but don't ever think that you know what that's like is my point. Until you've experienced yes. it, there's, you know, we can talk about it all day long. You can train and train and train for it like we did. Yeah. But yeah. until you actually get into the situation and the bullets start flying, there's, I don't think there's any way to predict how, number one, how a person is going to react. And number two, how they're going to feel about it afterwards. Um and again, that's where maybe my feelings are kind of more hardcore about it is we volunteered for this shit. So don't be whining around, you know, we knew what we were doing when we got into it. So, you know, don't cry over spilt milk. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, um, on that comment, quite a few of you uh, SOG men I've talked to all have that in mind. It's the same comment. We knew what we were doing. We signed on the dotted line multiple times. It was probably the people who were drafted, more of them, who really didn't want to go there, didn't want any part of it. And, you know, everyone's entitled to their own thoughts about that. But um, most of you and SOG I've talked to have all, you know, they weren't surprised at what they were getting into, right? And... One of my observations on all the interest in today's world on SAG is how many of these people that are interested in it have ever bothered to sign on the dotted line and put in their years? Probably very few. Yeah, you know, and I think it's very common um, for me. I'm not a veteran. I come from a family of veterans and i think that every alpha male watching any kind of movie that has combat whether it be police or that kind of situation or a war movie thing thinks i wonder how i would do in that and the guys i've been in some situations not in the combat world but that they think that they'd be good in a, in a bar fight or they think that they would be that they're all that. And when it comes down to it, they are not what they, it's not what they expected is what I'm trying to say. Until you've been in a bar fight, don't think about how you're going to act in a bar fight. Yeah. Go get in one and yeah. then you'll know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know. It, it's just, um, when you sign that paper that says I'll never disclose any of this for 20 years upon penalty of 20 years in Leavenworth, this little bell goes off and says, do you realize what you're getting into? And, you know, obviously you do because you get one last chance to back out. I mean, they gave us multiple chances right. 
to walk away. And 99% of us didn't walk away. There was a couple that did, but, you know, um, to each his own. Right. Um, I, um, you, you got to remember, too, that if you look at the times, okay, mid-60s, I graduated from high school in 1966. Um, I grew up, uh, you know, what we would do is on the weekends, as soon as breakfast is over, you're outside, you're playing either war or cowboys and Indians. When mom calls you for lunch, no matter where you are in the neighborhood, you better get your butt home for lunch. As soon as you're done with lunch, you're back outside till supper. When mom calls you in for supper, you better get in there and eat. And then you're back out till nine o'clock when it gets dark and you know you better have your butt in the house. And I really believe that that playing, however you want to phrase it, playing war or whatever, I really, I really believe that to a very, maybe a very small extent, but that helped formulate in our brain um, that combat um, mentality. It, it, I don't know. The kids today, they sit in mommy's basement when they're 30 years old playing video games. What the hell do they know about anything? And as long as mama keeps paying the bills, they, they're not motivated to join the military or get out and get a job or anything else, you know? So, yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm keeping <laughs> my mouth shut about, 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 I'm pleased that you brought that up. <laughs> so uh, maybe in the future we can have you on again. Um, Cause I'd like to try and keep to an hour um, and we're almost I look at the clock and we're almost at, at an hour here. Um, so as a final question, you've done a lot of uh, these interviews and podcasts. Um, are there some topics that you that you would like to talk more about in the future, whether it be on mine or Bud's or, or anybody else's? The number one, I've done 14 of Bud's podcasts. One question that's come up in every single one of them is talking about the loadout. Okay. In other words, the gear, uh, what we carried on a mission. And I was lis listening to Bill Spurgeon's uh, right. thing the other day, and he was recon. And I was listening to and, and picking up on the similarities and the differences. But that's one that comes up every single one and mainly because there's more and more people listening in right. and that haven't heard the previous ones or they haven't gone back and watched them right shame right. on them they need to watch them all because yeah. every one of the guys that's been interviewed has got stories um you know um that's to me that's the number one thing then um and I'm going to be doing one. I, I guess it's okay to make a plug for this. Uh, I'm going to be doing one shortly, either this week or the following week, uh, with myself and one of our forward air controller pilots. And we're going to be talking about the differences of what the guy on the ground sees versus what the guy in the air sees. And And just I thought it would be an interesting thing, and there seems to be a lot of interest in it comparing what the guys see i'd even like to have a uh an a1 pilot a spad and then you got three different perspectives because you got me or anybody else that's on the ground you got the forward air controller that's playing traffic cop and then you got the guys that are dropping the bombs and all three guys are seeing something completely different you know um so th there seems to be a lot of interest in that. Another one that there seems to be an awful lot of interest in, mainly because some, I think because some of the pictures that are in some of the books is all the different weapons that were available to us. Uh, well, did you ever carry this? Did you ever carry this? Well, what about this? And um, yes, yes, and yes. And what was your favorite? 
and the car 15, you know, hands down. Um, so that's another one is, is the weaponry. Um, not just the, 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 the rifles, but the pistols, the, uh, backups, you, if you want to call them that, um, um, grenades, um, the differences in the different types of grenades as time went on, what became available for the M79 other than just the high explosive round? Because after a while, you had, um, for instance, the flechette rounds, which are bad dudes, man. Um, and that held true for the pilots, too, like the, the forward air controllers. Instead of just having white phosphorus, they had HE rounds. And then later on in 69, they had the availability of of uh, flechette rounds out of those 2.75 inch rockets um i have a picture um you don't have it but uh, only because it wasn't on that disc but um one of our uh, chopper crew chiefs named bob I, I think i can use his name bob hall he put together a um what do you call it a cut open view showing the interior of a 2.75 round of flechettes. And there's like, I don't know, 1,500 or 2,000 of these little darts in that thing. And his son donated it to the Special Operations Association. And uh, I took, I got pictures of it, but man, you talk about it. So the, 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 the evolution of weaponry is another thing that there just seems to be a lot of interest in. To me, those are the the biggest things. Um, then there's there, there there's interest in different things that maybe would apply to recon, but not so much to hatchet force or vice versa, like selecting an RON and um, radio communications, um, working airstrikes, all that kind of stuff. There, there there's just so many guys getting involved and listening to these stories that haven't heard them all. And they're just wanting to, instead of listening to them, they're just asking the questions. And some of it, I try to just head off because I know the question's going to come. So let's just tell it, explain it and move on to the next thing. So. Well, I, I, you know, it's, I would like to have you on again uh, after Christmas, then maybe we can uh, talk about some of those things, you know, sure. it's great to have such a, a guy like you uh, who's so open about, um, you know, your years in SOG. So that's great. So for today, I think Terry, I think I'm going to stop it and um, we'll set, we'll set something up after Christmas. Very good. Um so available almost all the time so and then we can talk guns and knives and there you go and blowing things up yeah knives is another big subject yeah yeah okay so, well thank okay. you again okay bud take care see ya <laughs>